Well, while Jeff is away, um, he has given me the privilege of speaking this morning, and um, I, I have a greater privilege than the person that's speaking next week. The person that's speaking next week doesn't have the 8 o'clock service, right? So I get to go three times, that person gets to go twice, so, so I am blessed, and hopefully God's going to use this to bless you as well, but... Um, we bring greetings from Florida Gulf Coast University and Christian, or Impact Christian Campus Fellowship and invite you to come out and, and join us sometime. We have an open door out there on our meetings on Wednesday nights and um, you're always welcome. Love to give you a private tour sometime of the campus if you want as well. Let's, uh, let's ask God to bless our time together. Father, we just come to you as our Father knowing that you love us more than we can know. And we pray that we might know and experience that love and understand it more deeply, even now. And Lord, impress upon us your words this morning that um, we might enter into a richer and deeper communion with you and a greater conviction and um, resolve to be the people you want us to be and to do ministry the way you want us to do it. We pray these things in our blessed name of our Savior, in the blessed name of our Savior, Jesus, Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't need to tell you that we live in a world that is dysfunctional ununified, lacks a lot of harmony. I can't remember a time in my lifetime when there wasn't war or terrorism or um, unrest in the Middle East. And even here on our homeland, our nation seems split down the middle when it comes to political and philosophical and, and social issues, doesn't it? It seems like the only thing that people can agree upon these days is to disagree, right? And yet the world yearns for peace and harmony, doesn't it? Whether it be between nations or between ethnic groups or, or races or tribes or between a parent and child or between even husband and wife, our world yearns for harmony and oneness and unity. A couple weeks ago, Jeff... Uh, kind of opened up his message by mentioning an admirable characteristic that he has found here in his time at Anchor Christian Church. Anybody remember what that was? All right, we've got to report to Jeff. He's not, not being very, you know, you guys aren't catching him. It was unity. It was the unity that he has found here in this congregation. And today we celebrate even some of that unity um, as we look, in, you know, if you look in your bulletin, the kingdom offering and what has come in from that last week as we gave our, our gifts and as we made our pledges and so forth. And, uh, you know, beyond even the amount is the number of, of households that contributed. There was over 125, I was told, over 125 households that contributed to this kingdom offering through, through gifts or, and or pledges. And that is a, a very high percentage of the people who call this congregation home. Praise God for that kind of united participation. Satan is called the prince of this world, and he, he is the cause of division. He is called the cause of strife. He's the cause of disharmony. And from the very beginning... He used his deceptive tactics to destroy the harmony that was between man and God, between man and man, between man and nature, and between man and himself. Satan hates to see people in the church becoming whole, or getting along, or serving together to make a difference for Christ in this world of ours. He would love to see 
and is likely scheming to start infighting and backbiting and gossip and division and disharmony among us and among God's people. Because that's his greatest tactic, divide and conquer. And so this, this one thing, this unity among God's people is a very big thing to God. Very important thing to God. And coupled with love, it is the quality that God desires most in His people. Because, you see, oneness is the essence of who God is. He is, has revealed Himself to us as Father, and as Son, and as Holy Spirit. We call this the Trinity, the Godhead. Three in one. A picture of perfect harmony, of perfect oneness. And when He created the earth and mankind, He created it with oneness and a harmony in mind. He wants to have harmonious relationship with His creation, with us. And for us to have it with each other. It wasn't until Adam and Eve sinned that this, was, this oneness was disrupted. The reason Jesus was sent, died and rose again, was to begin the process of restoring that oneness, that one thing. So it makes sense that just before he was arrested, just before he was tried and executed, Jesus' main concern and prayer is about our one thing, oneness. But he didn't want unity for unity's sake. And it wasn't just so that we could have, uh, be a nice bunch of people to be around and support other nice people. No, there's much more at stake. Jesus knew that our one thing would be his essential tool to let the world know how much God loves them and that He sent Christ to save them. Our unity serves to reach the world. So I'm going to ask you if you, do, if you will, if you turn in your Bibles or in the uh, little New Testaments in front of you there, John chapter 17. And Jesus, this is the night Jesus is betrayed. It's the night, it's the Passover night. He has celebrated the Passover now with His disciples. Um, they're making their way, quite possibly, uh, to the Garden of Gethsemane, but they have not crossed over the Kidron Valley yet, so they're probably still in Jerusalem, maybe in the upper room, maybe in the temple area. But Jesus begins this discourse that John records in, in chapter 15, 16, 17. And in 17, the whole thing is His prayer. This is the Lord's Prayer, really, if you really want to know. it, He gives us the model prayer, that we follow and we recite, but this is his prayer. A whole chapter about it. He starts out praying about himself and his connection with what he's done and God and, and so forth, the Father. And then he, in verse 6, he starts talking, praying for his disciples, the, the 12, but it would apply to us as well. And we're going to, and then the latter part of it is where he prays for all believers, you know, those in the future. And so we're going to pick up at verse 11 and then read through the rest of the chapter. So follow along with me, if you will. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that Scripture would be fulfilled." I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of, the, of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father. Just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and you in me, 
may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Have you ever gone on a trip and met a stranger on that trip and both of you are miles from home and somehow during the conversation you realize you each know somebody, the same person, some, you know, somehow, some way. In, 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 has that hap- ever happened to anybody? Quite a few, right? You know, and, and all automatically, because we have that person in common, there is a bond between you and that stranger, right? We feel a connection there to them. So that's the way it is with those who have come to believe and to entrust their lives to Christ. Our common bond comes from our shared relationship with the Godhead through Jesus Christ. Look at verse 20 and 21. He says there, My prayer is that all of them may be in, or all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be, what? In us. In us. A relationship with the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Verse 22 goes on and says, That they may be one as we are one, I in them, and you in me, may they be brought to complete unity. Our unity is founded upon this relationship with God. Picture a bicycle wheel, if you will. The rim represents an unseen, invisible boundary of God's people, God's kingdom, God's family. Whoever is outside of the rim is not a part of the kingdom, is not a part of God's family, God's nation. And the spokes inside the rim represent every person who is a citizen of God's kingdom, who is a member of the family, every true follower of Jesus Christ. Now what is the one thing that holds those spokes together? It's the hub, isn't it? It's the hub. And if I have a relationship with Christ and you have a relationship with Christ, then we have someone in common that is holding us together. And we are related. We have a relationship because of that hub. Jesus prays for God's involvement concerning our unity. And as He prays for this, that, you know, may they be one because they are in us, He gives some specifics and and prays for some other things that would contribute to this unity and give us insights into a little bit more of what this oneness looks like that God is talking about. In our one thing, our unity, it's, it's preserved, it's protected by the power of His name. We share a common name that has the power to make and keep us one. Verse 11 says this, the second part, Holy Father, protect them by the power of Your name. The NIV says the power of Your name. ESV says uh, keep them in Your name. It goes on and says, The name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. The name. The name of someone in biblical times represented and stood for the person's character. The character of that person whose name is spoken. The name was equated with their very being, who they were as a person. The name of God involves all that He is. And so we are told in the New Testament to pray in the name of Jesus. To proclaim the name of Jesus. The apostles healed in the name of Jesus. We're to serve others in the name of Jesus. We are to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they baptized into the name of Jesus. Anoint the sick with oil in the name of the Lord. Call on the name of the Lord. Paul to the Colossians said, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. There is power in that name and our unity is kept and preserved 
through the name of Jesus. If you hadn't noticed, tis the season for March Madness. Now, if you're not a basketball fan, I apologize, because I know it's uh, kind of taken over the television and all that stuff. It's a time when our loyalty to teams and schools reaches unhealthy emotional highs and lows in a matter of seconds, right? We are loyal to our schools and to our teams. Our loyalty to the name of Jesus, however, is far more important than our loyalty to any team or to any school or political party or, or corporation or person or nation. Our loyalty to the Lord Jesus is to be the preeminent loyalty in our life. His name is to be above every name. When the first century Christian believers made the confession, Jesus is Lord, it meant much more than a soundbite statement of faith or a phrase to put on a t-shirt. It was a pledge of allegiance. It was a pledge of allegiance that defied the reigning Caesar and the Roman Empire. And that pledge to the name of Jesus could make one an enemy of the state. It could cost a person their job, their possessions, their family, their very life itself. It was in this name of Jesus, however, that broke down the social barriers of division and prejudice and injustice in the first century culture that promoted just the opposite. It was a very segregated and separated culture on all kinds of levels. It was this name of Jesus that made oneness possible between Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female, rich and poor, young and old. It brought them together into the hub of Jesus, the name of Jesus. Bob Russell used to conduct a little exercise in a member class at Southeast Christian Church in Louisville <clears throat> to illustrate the unity in the name. And so we're going to do that real quick here in just a moment. I want you to think about your, your background, your, your church background, your faith background, your religious background, <clears throat> whatever it might be. If you don't have any of background, then just we're all going to state it out loud in just a moment. Just say, I don't have one, okay? That's okay. There's no judgment here on this. We're just going to state your background, you know, Methodist, Baptist, Hindu, whatever, out loud after the count of three. All right, so you got it in mind? Out loud now. One, two, three. Brethren. Do you understand that? Okay, now kind of confusing, not real coherent, right? Okay, now, after the count of three, I, I want us to all just say Jesus. Okay, one, two, three. Jesus. There is unity and harmony when we focus on the name of Jesus. Not only does he pray that we be kept in God's name, but Jesus prays that the disciples be sanctified. Be sanctified. That sounds like a real religious term, doesn't it? Look at verses 14 through 19. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, and they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. This word sanctified can be translated set apart, can be translated consecrated. It's the same word from which we get the word saint or holy one. And though Jesus will soon be leaving to rejoin the Father, he said he's not taking his followers with him. They're going to remain. He's, they're, they're, they're staying to take on his character in order to be able to carry on his mission. And so... One of the aspects of being sanctified is the development of this holy character. We are called to take on and reflect the character of Christ, just as He reflected the character of the Father. 
Look right up here to Anchor's mission statement. Love God, love our neighbors, being the hands, feet, and what? Heart of Jesus. I think that our character has uh, uh, this idea of the heart of Jesus, who Jesus was. And so the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, those would, would be some of our benchmarks, our, our measuring stick of, of who we are as a person and as a, as a church. People who practice this together in their church community will experience the one thing. A shared lifestyle of holiness will produce a loving and vibrant church that sincerely cares for people, helps people meet needs. It will be a joyful group of people where, where judgment is rare and grace and mercy are abound. And it will be an unusual and strange group of people. And the people outside the rim will say, Behold, how they love one another. The second aspect of the sanctification has to do with being set apart for sacred use. We're called to be sent into the world. Verse 18, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. While our holy lives will honor our Lord, will bring Him glory, and will benefit the body of Christ, we are not to keep hidden in our holy huddles. Matthew 5.14 says, Jesus says this, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to all the household, to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So our sacred calling is to humbly take our sacred and strange lifestyle and this unique and and unusual harmony that we experience with one another. and take it into an unholy and divided world. Will it look different? Will it attract attention? You bet. You bet. That's the point. Because it paves the way for us to let the world know that Jesus was sent by God, that God loves them, and invites them to join in on the one relationship with Him and with his people. Does the world know that God loves them? Are they seeing it in us? Are we living it out in front of them? And it's important to note that these two aspects of sanctification, our own holiness and our being set apart to go out and, and influence the world, are founded in the Word of God. Verse 17, Sanctify them by the truth, Your word is truth. Our unity must be based on the authority of the Scriptures. When decisions have to be made, whether it be individually, as we're making them in our own homes, or corporately, as a church, the church that finds their oneness in Christ will submit their wills to His word. Christ must have the final say, or we will be no different than the rest of the world, just making up our minds in our own human wisdom. The Word of God is the Word of God. The Word of God is powerful and active, just like the name of God. And it will bring about the sanctification needed for us to experience that beautiful one thing, that oneness that He wants. It'll change us from the inside out if we allow it, if we submit to it, and we obey it. God is blessing Anchor Christian Church. And it's so exciting to see seats filled and plans to expand. It's thrilling to be involved in a church that's reaching into the community. How encouraging it is to have middle school and high school students so involved and engaged. Now, I don't see any here this morning, but, you know, next service, come in and you'll see some. And we could go on and on and list the different things. I think one of the beautiful things about this congregation is that, that uh, there is an interest in the young being generally an older congregation, there is still this interest in, in 
reaching the community and the young people in it, that's admirable. But we've got to guard that harmony. We've got to guard that oneness by keeping the name of Jesus the focus of our lives. Keeping His Word as the authority in our lives. May we sincerely do all that we do in the name of Jesus. May we see ourselves set apart as sacred people living differently than the world lives called to be a special, on a special sacred mission. And then we will experience the answer to Jesus' prayer. We will be one so that the world will know that God sent Jesus and that the world will know that God loves them. That God so loved the world, say it with me, that He gave His one and only Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life.